Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine's Zoominar producer. I want to thank you for joining us for this very important conversation, The World's Order Under Threat, How Russia, Iran, and China Benefit from the Israel-Hamas War with Elon Berman and Nadine Epstein. This program will be available on our website at momentmag.com. We will continue hosting additional conversations in the coming days and weeks, and Moment's editorial team will continue updating our website with new articles. Again, you can find all of this at momentmag.com. Now for today's program. Ilan Berman, an expert on regional security in the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Russian Federation, is Senior Vice President of the American Foreign Policy Council. He has consulted for the CIA, the Departments of State and Defense, and has provided assistance on foreign policy and national security issues to a range of governmental agencies and congressional offices. A frequent writer and commentator, Alan has written for the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, and the New York Times, among many other publications. He is also the author of five books, as well as the editor of six, including Taking on Tehran, Strategies for Confronting the Islamic Republic, and most recently, Wars of Ideas, Theology, Interpretation, and Power in the Muslim World. Joining Ilan today is Nadine Epstein, Editor-in-Chief and CEO of Moment Magazine, and Founder and Executive Director of the Center for Creative Change. Please welcome Ilan Berman and Nadine Epstein. Thank you, Ilan, for joining us today. You are an expert on Iran and on the Middle East and on Central Asia and the Russian Federation, and I've heard you speak about China as well. Today, we're, we have two major wars raging, one between Russia and Ukraine, the other between Israel and Hamas, as well as missiles being fired from Iranian proxy groups such as Hezbollah towards Israel. And I wanted to speak to you so you could help me and our audience better understand the links between all these players and what what this could foretell. I wanted to start with a few big question, big uh, picture questions. Um, sure. I've been thinking a lot about the current liberal democracy world order, the one that was ushered in through World War II, and how it feels threatened now perhaps more than ever, at least in my lifetime. And I'd love to hear what you think about the state of that world order, whether it it can withstand the aggressiveness of Putin's Russia, Xi's growing authoritarianism, the steel grip that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard has over its people, no matter what they seem to do, the influence of Iran and all its proxies in the Middle East, and, and of course now the Hamas invasion and the war between Gaza Hamas in Israel, and the way that's just reignited, reignited old hatreds and ignited new ones. How how does how does this all fit together in your mind? Well, <laughs> not neatly, but uh, I'm glad you started with a uh, with an easy question, right? This is the sixty four thousand dollar question uh, to me that I'm grappling with, but. Uh, where, where I s sort of start thinking about this, honestly, is the fact that it's a truism of geopolitics that disorder somewhere breeds disorder elsewhere. And so when you see a conflict, particularly a conflict that is not contained, uh, that's been taking place for almost two years uh, between Russia and Ukraine, and, and it's sort of become a uh, uh, sort of a fight for survival on the part of the Ukrainians. But uh, for many governments, particularly in Europe, it's become this sort of proxy conflict against, you know, the bear at the door, the sort of the the, the specter of Russian imperialism. Um, but what the West hasn't managed to do yet is to stand the Kremlin down, to really raise the cost to such an extent that the Russians are uh, sort of on the back foot, that they're really reconsidering their strategic calculations. And when you have a situation like that, uh, it's only a matter of time until disorder spreads because there are other uh, players in the international system that understand that the sort of the arbiters of world order, if you will, the sort of the policemen, the sheriff, um, and you know, uh, in many regards, for a long time, that's been the traditional role of the United States, is distracted, is uh, sort of uh, preoccupied, and they understand that uh, if they want to push the boundaries, this would be the time to do it. Um, the uh, the current war between Israel and Hamas 
uh, obviously a tragedy on many levels, this sort of horrific uh, spillover of violence, but it uh, bears noting that it was it's violence that has been in large part orchestrated and the scene for it has been set by Iran. And the Iranians are one of those actors that are really sort of pushing on the boundaries of the uh, Western liberal world order. China is another. Um, and what I really worry about is, as we see first one, now two global conflicts, is that you know we know very well that China under Xi Jinping has an increasingly adventurous, aggressive, confrontational foreign policy. And China has reprioritized the retaking of Taiwan to be a, a key cardinal national security priority. And if you're Xi Jinping in Beijing, and you're looking at the degree to which the U.S. is having trouble managing existing world conflict. Your calculation is that if you're going to move against Taiwan, now is probably a good time. Now is an attractive time. And in this way, you sort of have this snowballing effect where a conflict somewhere creates at least the conditions for uh, a potential conflict elsewhere. And that's what I worry about, right? We're in a very dangerous time because, not because liberty is under threat, although uh, it most definitely is. Uh, but because what we see is that increasingly liberty is under threat in different ways, because we're confronting, uh, we were confronting uh, this Russian revanchist imperialism. Now we're confronting that and Islamic extremism. And we could be confronting Chinese imperialism shortly, right? And, and so we have to rack and stack how good of a job that we're doing uh, as to, you know, it, it, I base that on can we deter the spread of additional conflicts? Well, we're going to get into Iran in a minute, but before we do, what do you, I mean, it seems like I'm just, the United States is doing, what do you think of our, the job that we're doing as a country? Um, I mean, how how are we doing so far? Given the fact that it's very challenging. <laughs> right. Um so I, I candidly, I think it's a mixed bag, and and I'll explain what I mean. Um, the uh, I'm I'm the child of Soviet refuseniks. I am a, a, a massive proponent of the need to continue aid to Ukraine uh, because I very much understand. Right, this is sort of you know what I was brought up with. This is uh, this uh, threat posed by Russia to Ukrainian independence and sovereignty sort of really resonates with me. So I. I I approach this as a proponent of, you know, helping the Ukrainians as much as we can uh, to stand athwart Russia, to sort of really, uh, you know, force the Kremlin to fail. But I can't help noticing that our policy, although rhetorically, right, nothing to complain about. The White House has been rhetorically very robust in uh, support for Ukraine. But in uh, in practice, uh, we've done things that have raised questions. You know, for for example, you know, we've allocated a ton of money, and it's now become a domestic political issue. And in, in coming weeks and months, it's going to really play out uh, on the national debate stage as sort of you know candidates from the Republican Party take opposing views um, because of the amount of money that we've allocated. But in terms of what we've actually given them, right? The Ukrainians have been clamoring for months and months and months for advanced fighter aircraft, for long range standoff missiles that would really allow them to strike Russian military positions from further abroad or further afield so that they they would have to put their forces at risk less, right? And we've been very slow to give that. And the way the world works, uh, particularly in this conflict, the uh, all of our international allies, right? Germany and Poland and everybody else, is taking their cues from what Washington does, right? So they're saying the same things that we're saying, but they're not gonna get ahead of us in terms of allocating these game-changing systems. So I, I worry about that. And I worry about that because we are uh, we, we run the risk of creating this fait accompli, right? Uh, early next year, when, uh, you know, in all likelihood, the Ukraine war has become a stalemate, you will have people who want to curtail aid to Ukraine uh, say, hey, listen, we've allocated one hundred and twenty billion dollars or what, you know, whatever the number is. Um, and it's a stalemate. We shouldn't give any more money. We already but have the those people. They're already. No, they're already, no. Well, well, yeah, absolutely. That's the debate that's going on in the House right now. And the Republican absolutely. majority. And yeah. it's, going to, it's going to intensify. And yeah. they're not wrong. But I would argue that they're uh, that the reason for this sort of this move towards a stalemate 
isn't because we're giving aid. It's because we're not giving the right kind of aid. Or quickly um, and enough. So, well, quickly enough, we're not uh, sort of we're not uh, providing the systems that would really make a difference on the battlefield. And we're also, uh, frankly, not being coherent. So I'll just a, a little okay. uh, map, mapping exercise for you, just so you understand. The, uh, the problem, sort of the intrinsic problem that we see, I think, uh, from uh, the Biden administration's foreign policy is that it tends to compartmentalize different issues. And so Iran policy is Iran policy. It has nothing to do with Ukraine policy. But that's actually not the case. So what you have is a Biden administration that is simultaneously giving uh, I think the tally uh, to, as of today is $113 billion uh, in both military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine, right? You can't argue with the robustness of that financial package. But at the same time, it is not really enforcing sanctions on Iran. Uh, it has given, uh, it has now been frozen, but it has given $6 billion to Iran as a result of this but hostage frozen, swap yeah. that's frozen, yes. But the end result is that Iran actually has more money. And what the Iranians are doing with that more money is they're building drones that they're then selling to the Russians, right? So okay. what you have is this well, real interesting intellectual situation where we are sort of, you know, on both sides of the conflict. So let's step back a little bit here. Um, I'm just going to say that, I mean, it looks to me like America, the United States is doing, you know, it's definitely doing a lot to support Ukraine against Russia. And um, but let's talk about Iran. Um, so obviously from what we've read, from what I've read, Iran has played a major role in helping Hamas and is, you know, behind really, you know, to me, it looks to me like the invasion that occurred on October 7th. And then of course, even the PR war that has occurred after that and the actual, what we're seeing in Gaza today now are really all a victory for Iran. Um, it's like, you know, we've been talking about this threat from Iran for years, and here we have it. We have this is this is how it is manifested. And so, how does this war fit into Iranian strategy? Right. No, and I I really think that that is a question that more people should be asking because it's very clear that the Iranians in this conflict are both the arsonist and the firefighter. They have created the conditions in the Palestinian territories that have enabled aggression by Hamas and aggression by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, but uh, wh why? It's not just because they hate Israel, and it's, uh, although they do, and it's not just because they hate the United States, although they do. It's because I, 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 the way I see it is, is this way. Um, the Iranians are dealing, right? If you're, if you're sitting in Tehran and you're looking at the world, you have three problems, three main problems. One is local, right? Because what you have is you have a, an Iranian regime, right? 85 million people. Uh, the vast majority, right, um, two thirds of the Iranian population is 36 or younger, which means that the Ayatollahs, right, who came to power 44 years ago, uh, have an uphill battle in terms of selling their ideology. And increasingly over the last year, although it's been much longer than that, you have this real sort of sense that we've crossed the Rubicon. You have these persistent protests. Iranians are discontented. Uh, all politics is local. And the Iranian regime really has a domestic problem um, that they're trying to deal with, right? Um, and uh, these are protests that have persisted despite massive regime repression, right? Like sort of the killing of protesters, the mass imprisonment uh, of others. So that's the first problem. That's the local problem. The, uh, there's a, the second layer of problems is regional. Uh, because what you've seen over the last three years, as Israel has drawn closer to the countries of the Abraham Accords, is an increasingly isolated Iran. Right. And this, by the way, this is not just a product of the Abraham Accords, but the Abraham Accords have really sort of locked in this shift. Um, you can sort of, you know, this this dates back to 15 years ago when, you know, everybody in the Gulf and uh, the Jewish state both were worried about uh, an incipient Iranian nuclear program. Right. And, and but out of that security dialogue came these cultural ties, these economic ties. Um, that really sidelined Iran in regional geopolitics. Um, and if you notice, uh, one of the things that Iran has been trying to do um, over the last six months, right, the Iranian foreign minister, um, Abdullahian, he is not uh, as charismatic as his pre predecessor, Javad Zarif, and yet he is making tremendous gains because what he's done over the last six, eight months is he has visited every capital in the region 
that has either signed a normalization agreement with Israel or is about to, right? Or, or is, is sort of uh, uh, considering doing so. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to lessen that isolation, right? So the Iranians, right, that second layer of crisis is the Iranians see the Abraham Accords and Israel's integration into the region as a zero sum game. The stronger Israel is, the weaker the Iranians are and vice versa. And the third layer is international isolation. And this is driven by the uh, Iranian nuclear program, right? So the Iranian nuclear program, it's been 20 years since it broke out into the open. And every administration since then in the United States has tried to curtail uh, Iran, uh, Iran's development of nuclear weapons through isolation, right? Some do it through engagement uh, and trying to change the behavior. Uh, some do it through, through isolation. But the end result is right, largely the same, right? We're trying to sort of uh, to neutralize or at least to, to sort of to limit the threat posed by an Iranian nuclear program. If you're Iran and you're looking at that top level of problems, um, things are going more your way now than they were under the last administration, right? Your economy is more stable. Um, the Biden administration is really interested in talking to you. You may not be interested in talking to it, but it is very interested in talking to you. So you sort of feel, you may sort of, uh, you could be excused for thinking that that, for, that top layer of crisis is sort of solving itself. But those other two la layers of crisis remain. Well, right? Let, let me regional... ask a couple of questions here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm always shocked by the, the firm grip that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard has on Iran, despite the protests and despite what looks to be, what we hear, what looks like, to be the really unhappiness of its people with the role of the IRG. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about why why do these protests fail again and again? What you know, what it, what is it that makes the IRG so uh impossible to uh to get rid of? Right. Well, no, I mean th there's a couple of answers. Um, but I think the very basic one is that you can't fight something with nothing. Um, so I've spent a lot of time talking to different Iranian opposition groups, to different Iranians in the diaspora. Um, and what strikes me, right, what's very clear to me is that the whole is less than the sum of its parts, right? The Iranian opposition wave, right? These different protesters, you know, they believe in different things, but to a man, to a woman, they're very passionate, they're animated. They understand that the Islamic Republic is an unreformable construct that it needs to go away. But what they can do is they can't articulate what comes after. And part of that has to do with local politics, right? It's all these opposition groups jockeying with each other for power. But the end result is that you get a situation where uh, the opposition is disunited and it's fragmented in a way that actually advantages the regime. It advantages the regime because if you're the United States or if you're the European Union and you need to talk to somebody, the Iranian regime is the only sort of stable party that you can talk to. And it advantages the Iranian regime because if these guys can't settle on a sort of a common agenda, a common set of principles, then it's very easy to pick them off. It's very easy to divide and conquer. And that's exactly what you've been seeing within Iran itself. This idea of being able to you know, imprison some, intimidate others, uh, curtail access to the internet, and try to get the protest to fizzle out. And it's been largely successful because there hasn't been this sort of coming together of the Iranian opposition. There hasn't been this very clear vision of, okay, you don't have to have the Islamic Republic. Here's what we want instead, right? So the best way I could describe it is the Re Islamic Republic has succeed, uh, excuse me, succeeded so far because the opposition doesn't know what it's for. It only knows what it's against. It's against the regime. But then they have other ideas about which way the country should go after. And that's been the saving grace of the Ayatollahs. OK. Um, well, I'm just curious also, like there's been a lot of talk about how really Iran, um, you know, was directly is directly connected with Hamas. And I'm just wondering right. what evidence is really out there in terms of money, in terms of weapons training. Of course, I read that, you know, a number of Hamas fighters who who did the who were who were part of the invasion on, on October seventh were trained in Iran. Um how much of this is true and how much of it isn't? So uh, I, I think to a very large extent it's true. 
whether this is uh, dispositive, uh, it's a little bit more nuanced in the case of Hamas than it is uh, with regard to Hezbollah. I know that you've had it on Honey and Gadar previously, and she talked about Hezbollah. Hezbollah is, to quote a friend, is the perfect proxy um, in the sense that Hezbollah was created by Iran. Hezbollah is a very authentic representation of the uh, of the Ayatollah Khomeini's sort of vision for exportation of the revolution. Hamas isn't that. Hamas isn't even a Shiite group. Hamas is a Sunni group. But mm-hmm. what you've had is the Iranian regime has proven itself to be very, very pragmatic in sponsoring proxies. In sponsors Shiite groups like the Houthi rebels in Yemen and Shiite militias in Iraq, but it also sponsors Sunni groups like the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, like Hamas, right? Because they serve a common goal. Uh, the mm-hmm. common goal is this sort of this exportation of instability. And all of that sort of traces back to Iranian strategic culture. So uh, everybody forgets, right? Because it's sort of a a moment in history, but right after the Islamic revolution of 1979, Iran fought a grueling grinding eight year war with Iraq. And what the Iranians discovered uh, was that they were not a match for Iraq in conventional terms, right? Khomeini even called this drinking from the poison chalice when he had to sign a ceasefire. And ever since, the Iranians have been looking for asymmetric ways to advance their objectives. And they've settled on proxies, right, both Sunni and Shiite, as a really good way of advancing their regional status and their geopolitical objectives without having to come into direct confrontation. So that's in the context of Hamas, that's taken the form of up to, right, according to U.S. government estimates, up to $100 million every year that is allocated. Now, that's not the sum total of Hamas's money. Right. It's different from the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad, smaller, less popular, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Islamic Republic. Hamas is different. Hamas is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. They have inputs from elsewhere. But the the money that Hamas that uh, Hamas has received from Iran has done tremendous things in terms of increasing the lethality of their weaponry, in terms of giving money, uh, giving training. Right. This is uh, the Iranians have helped to make. Hamas a graver threat to the Jewish state. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, Let's go back to Russia a little bit. So many observers have said that really the last several administrations, the United States has been really less visible in the Middle East than it had been for a long time. And this started maybe in the Trump years and has continued on in the Biden years until until very recently. And I'm, I'm, I'm just curious... I know we've talked about this before, but what has Russia done to to fill this vacuum? Right. Or this perceived well, vacuum? It's not. Yeah. Right. 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 No, no. no. And, 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 you know, I, I think that's an excellent question because uh, even if it's perceived, nature abhors a vacuum. Right. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the sense that the U.S. is pivoting away from the Middle East, pivoting towards Asia. Right. This was uh, under the Obama administration, even before the rise of Xi Jinping in China. Um, really created this perception of empty political space that others could fill, right? And and the Russians um, have really done a good job in filling that space. Um, And their conversation about the Middle East uh, begins, it doesn't end, but it begins with Syria, uh, right? So the the current level of Russian engagement in the Middle East uh, dates back to September of 2015, when the Russian military made the decision that uh, the Assad regime, uh, which was a, uh, was and remains a key proxy of the Kremlin, was in danger of falling, in danger of falling to domestic opposition forces, in danger of falling to the Islamic State. So it needed to be bolstered, it needed to be backstopped. And that created, that sort of paved the groundwork for the insertion of the Russian military, right? Now, fast forward almost a decade, and what you see is that Syria has become a springboard for Russia to re-engage the Middle East more broadly. Uh, Russia is doing military trainings, establishing military bases all over Africa, in particular in North Africa. Uh, It has ramped up its arms sales uh, beyond Syria to the countries of the Persian Gulf. Um, And uh, it has, in asymmetric terms, really established, you know, planted a flag uh, in the region in a meaningful way. Um, I know all of your viewers uh, have sort of, you know, at least know experientially, know in passing the name of Genny Prigozhin, right? He was the, he was the uh, chef, restaurateur, uh, come warlord 
that, uh, you know, uh, ran this weird abortive coup against the Kremlin and then died, it, it died mysteriously in a plane accident. And I use scare quotes, um, uh, you know, shortly uh, after the abortive coup. But his real claim to fame was that in the last stages of his life, he was the head of a group called Wagner. Wagner was uh, Russia's premier paramilitary organization. It was uh, it operated very much as an appendage of Russian foreign policy, and it had tremendous success in the Persian Gulf, but even more so in Africa, uh, mm -hmm. where it engaged with regional regimes. It helped those regional regimes fight against uh, Islamist insurgents, and it helped backstop authoritarian regimes. So in this way, this isn't what the Chinese do, which is they just throw a bunch of cash at local governments, right? The Russians aren't in a position to do that because the Russian economy isn't doing very well. But what they've managed to do is to lock in these regimes by giving them, you know, by augmenting their military with capabilities that allow them to withstand challenges. So is, is Putin as threatened by the new Middle East as Iran is? It's interesting because uh, it's not clear that he is. Look, uh, the, the, what you have in Iran's case is something that doesn't exist in Russia's case. Russia is not part of the Sunni Shiite tug of war for primacy in Islam. Russia is not a Muslim country, although Russia, if it were to weigh in on, on a certain side, you know, uh, politically, it's weighed in on Iran's side, but in terms of demographics, it's 98% Sunni in terms of its Muslim minority. So, um, but uh, the Iranians are uh, have been historically threatened by this trend, by this regional integration that has brought Israel closer and pushed Iran to the side. Um, the Russians see oppor uh, the way best way I could describe it is they see opportunity within adversity. They see the growing calls for a ceasefire. They see the uh, the fact that Gulf states are trying to recalibrate their positions as a potential window of opportunity. And this is important because if you notice, the uh, global public opinion has turned pretty decisively against the Kremlin, less so than we think in the West, because if you're an African leader, if you're a Middle Eastern leader, you care about the local impacts. You care about food shortages. You care about uh, you know your population not coming out in the street and expressing their displeasure. Uh, which is why Russia has spent so much time engaging with these regimes. Um, but as these governments begin to rethink, you know, what they thought was a new era in Middle East politics, this is an opportunity for uh, for the Kremlin. It's an opportunity for the Kremlin to expand its influence. And, and you see the Russians doing just that, even as, you know, they're recalibrating at home, they're recalibrating their Ukraine policy, they're recalibrating sort of how they look at the world. But they clearly see that, uh, Israel and the United States, at least for the moment, are on the back foot, and it's an opportunity. So you actually have written, you wrote recently an article that was in the Middle East Quarterly about really the role of Islam inside Russia. It's always been my impression that the Russian elites really are uncomfortable with their Muslim minority. Um, right. And... Um, so how and and we just saw what happened in Dagestan, where over a thousand yep. people stormed yep. the airport looking for Israelis. Um, I'm just curious about how this this rise of Islam in Russia, how it, is it is it reshaping the Kremlin's policy in some right. way towards Iran or towards the Middle East? Right. Well, so okay, so a slight correction: they were looking for Jews. And oh, yes, the, no, 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 you're no, right. No, you're not, absolutely not just correct. As, okay. No, no, not you're, just Israelis. You're correct. And, and, the reason this is important, I think, uh, in the context is because what you're seeing uh, in that attempted pogrom, right, which is really what it was, is this intersection of a couple of really profound trends that have taken place in Russia. First is the growth and radicalization of Islam uh, in Russia itself. So remember mm -hmm. that in the uh, during the seven plus decades of the Cold War, the Soviet Union was formally atheist. So. Um, you, when the Soviet Union fell apart in 1990, 91, 92, you had this situation where there were millions upon millions of people, both on the territory of what became the Russian Federation, but also in uh, sort of in the periphery, in Central Asia and parts of the Caucasus that didn't really have any idea about um, uh, sort of how Islam should be practiced beyond 
the way it was practiced at home by their parents and their grandparents. So this made the what's what we sort of call as a term of art the post-Soviet space this real battleground for ideological influence. Right, you saw the sort of the encroachment of radical groups like Hizb ut and Tabligh Jama'at and others, even groups like. Uh, the Islamic State uh, more recently, but Al Qaeda and others um, as a way of trying to shape Muslim minds. Mm -hmm. um, and this is particularly pronounced in uh, the North Caucasus, in Chechnya and in Dagestan, where there has been there's a massive uh, Muslim minority. Um, 80 percent of Dagestan is Muslim. Um, but also you're seeing very, very alarming signs of radicalization among that minority. Right. So you have that new sort of growth of not just Islam, but growth of a, an extreme form of Islam in Russia, right? You add to that the fact that Muslims are Russia's fastest growing minority, right? Demographically, they're outpacing uh, the Slavic population of Russia. So they're becoming a bigger and bigger voice in national politics. And you add to that the tradition of, uh, you know, the, the very sorry tradition that, you know, my family has a lot of experience with, you know, this, the pog pogroms for, you know, the persecution of the Jews. Um, and you layer that all together and the Russian government is sitting atop a tinderbox. And it's a tinderbox that you're seeing in the context of the Jews now, but it's a tinderbox more broadly later because the sort of the centrally organized, very exclusionary, ultra-nationalist identity that Vladimir Putin has built for Russia doesn't have any room in it for Muslims. So the Muslims don't feel part of the Russian Federation. And you're beginning to see that in sort of in, in very dramatic ways. Um, so what you saw in Dagestan was terrible, but I also think that it's the uh, sort of the start of a, a, a trend to come. So you're saying that the Muslims in in the Russian Federation actually can be a threat to Putin down the line. Absolutely. No, I, and, and sort of the, the empirical evidence uh, for this was, um, and we, we all remember a few years ago when the Islamic State was at the height of its power, uh, what, eight years ago uh, in the Middle East, um, the area, global area, where that had the highest number of foreign fighters, that drew the highest number of foreign fighters, was cumulatively the countries of the Russian Federation and Central Asia, right? These were Muslims that radicalized and mobilized, and they joined, they traveled to the Middle East to join the Islamic State. The Russian Federation, Russian authorities were more than happy to let them go, right? Because they were externalizing the problem. They sort of let them well, go over there. And, you know, we'll sort of, you know, uh, you're not a problem at home. But that's not where we are now, right? You know, we're sort of in, in a post-Islamic state period. You have a situation where the, um, I mean, Ukraine is a great example of this, where in Ukraine right now, you have units of Muslim fighters that are fighting for the Kremlin. And you have uh, units of Muslim fighters that are fighting for Ukraine against the Kremlin, right? And that tells you everything you need to know about how fractious this identity politics really can be in Russia. Yes, it's amazing. Um, so I, just as the Israel-Hamas war is a big win for Iran, it seems like it's just a, a big win for Putin. I mean, are you worried about the Ukrainian war, Ukrainian cause, losing visibility and support around the world? Absolutely. And, and I, I think the Ukrainians are worried about this, too. Um, mm -hmm. And the Ukrainians have been doing uh, the Ukrainian leadership has been doing a very savvy thing. And they've been they've been working overtime, you know, in a, in a very uh, sort of very heartfelt, but also, I think, a very pragmatic fashion to try to link the two conflicts together, to try to explain how what Vladimir Putin is doing to them is not so dissimilar to what Iran and Hamas are trying to do to Israel. Um, part of that is authentic for sure, right? They feel like they're in a fight for their survival very much the way uh, Israelis now do. But part of it is also pragmatic because they see the writing on the wall. They see that there is a push in American politics to decouple the two issues. And they know that uh, support for Israel is stronger and more bipartisan than support for Ukraine. And as a result, they're worried about being left behind. And I think there's good reason for them to be worried uh, about being left behind. The really interesting thing here is what's happening in terms of Israeli perceptions. Um, and we saw this at the start of the of the Russian invasion of, and, and aggression against Ukraine, where Israel was saying the right things. But a lot of us, you know, myself included, thought that Israel could be more forthright about uh, supporting Ukraine against Russia. 
And you heard all of these arguments about why they weren't, right? Because Russia was president in Syria, we had to, you know, we have to worry about the Northern Front because there's over a million uh, Israelis of Russian extraction. And so there's lots of sort of familial ties and political ties, um, right? I understand all of those reasons, but pragmatically speaking, uh, Israel was in a position to do more and to do more of substance for Ukraine earlier than it actually did. But now you're seeing this sort of awakening, this belated awakening that's taking place in Israel, where Israelis on social media and in the press are saying, you know what, we were wrong. We miscued on this early on. We now understand why it was important to support Ukraine, just like Ukraine is supporting us. So that messaging about a common fight is, I think, morally very important. It's pragmatic on the part of the Ukrainians, but it's morally very important for Israelis. And it brings us back to that they're understanding that the sort of liberal world order is under threat. So right. they're, sh- and which is something that maybe not everyone in the United States is really understanding at this point, right. that they really are connected. So if you're, you're uh, there's this growing Putin-Chi relationship, which kind of grew out of Putin's need to for weapons and support for his war against Ukraine. How is that growing connection worrisome to, to Israel? So, well, it's... It, or is so it? Two, two, well, two things here, right? It, it's worrisome to Israel and it's worrisome to us. It's worrisome to us because there's two schools of thought in Washington here, where I am. Um, one school is that this is a strategic alliance and the other school is that it's a strategic alignment, right? And there's a big difference between the two. I, I tend to fall into the latter camp. I think it's a, it's an alignment because it's tactical and it's limited because by any empirical metric, China's a rising power, Russia's a declining power, right? Economically, demographically, politically. Um, and uh, the things that Vladimir Putin is doing, right? Um, the leadership in Beijing may see uh, as making their life harder, right? The reintegration of Taiwan harder, sort of all these different things. It's clear that the ties between Moscow and Beijing, at least for the moment, are much more durable than China's ties to the United States and Russia's ties to the United States. But I think over the longer term, the natural mode of these two countries is competition, right? Competition over resources and over territory. Um, Where Israel fits in this is, I think, very interesting because you've also seen an Israeli evolution in thinking about China. Uh, So... Well, we all read, right? You have, I have, we've read uh, Startup Nation, right? From 13 years ago, right? An excellent book and really the blueprint for how Israel convinced the world that it was this incuba- incubator for tech and innovation and, and sort of, you know, economic dynamism as a result of the unique features of its economy and its polity. Um, and uh, the Israeli government also bought into Startup Nation to the point where, uh the prime minister, right, then as now, Benjamin Netanyahu, really threw the doors open to investment from abroad. And China became a major, major stakeholder in uh, Israel, in particular in Israel's high tech sector. Um, and now there was a couple of years, right, we've uh, sort of, we're in a much more modest state now, but we're in a more modest state now where Chinese investment is more modest in Israel now than it was four or five years ago, because Uh, In no uncertain terms, U.S. officials from this administration and the last one have been telling the Israelis, look, there are downside risks. This isn't just an economic partnership. This is a national security partnership. We're worried about Chinese tech. We're worried about Chinese penetration into your infrastructure. Um, And so there's there's always been this creative tension between Israel's desire for acceptance and for foreign direct investment and also the understanding that China is increasingly clear increasingly clearly not a responsible stakeholder on the world stage. And so the Israelis up until the current conflict have sort of tried to square that, right? They've sort of they've drawn down the level of Chinese investment in Israel, but they've still minded their P's and Q's. Um, mm. and, and the way uh, one economist in Israel explained it to me is they said, look, the uh, Israeli high tech sector is the lifeblood of our economy. The Israeli high tech sector is leveraged on Taiwanese superconductor chips. And when, not if, but when China takes over Taiwan, if we've not positioned ourselves properly, they could be in a position to throttle our economy. Right. And that's a huge sort of you know, wake up moment when you sort of understand that the Israelis are really playing this very sophisticated chess game. The current conflict, though, I think, has the potential to really change this. Right. China has come out 
with a whole bunch of unconstructive statements that have really sort of, you know, uh, the hackles, uh, uh, raise the hackles on the uh, sort of uh, on Israeli officials. It's really aligned itself with what it sees as the prevailing current in the Muslim world. And I say it sees because I'm not sure that that's a prevailing current that sort of uh, stays over time you know, for a whole host of reasons. But either way, I think we end up after this conflict with a much chillier relationship between Jerusalem and Beijing. Uh, which is a big change. Wow, thank you. Let's let's touch on Turkey really briefly, and then I have a sure. couple big picture questions for you. So, sure. first of all, like China, but much more, much more extremely than you know, China. Erdogan has come out in support of Hamas, right. and how does how does Erdogan? What does he want, and how does Erdogan fit into this puzzle of? the Israeli Hamas war. I mean, yet still there is, and there's still a relationship. There's still, you know, diplomatic relations right. between Israel, you know, air Turkey, I don't, you know, still flies. I don't know if it's flying right now, but there's still this right, whole right. relationship. Right. So he's playing sort of always these two sides, but what does he want now? What, how does he gain from this? How does, well, it's, in, it's interesting because that uh, massive uh, pro-Palestine rally that you saw him give a speech at in which he warned, right, I think very brazenly about a, you know, sort of the possibility of a new, what he called a crescent crusader clash, right, is sort of raising the specter of holy war, came the day before the 100th anniversary of the establishment of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk's republic, right? And so it was a signaling message to the Turks and to the Muslim world, right? So here's a guy who started out as an Islamist, right? Very clearly, right? As an Islam, he was a mayor, right? When he was mayor of Istanbul uh, in the 1990s, he talked about the, the need to transform Turkey into uh, an Islamic caliphate. Um, he has over time adopted all these nationalist leanings, right? So he's this sort of interesting hybrid leader now. He's not an Islamist in the same way that we understand it, but his vision of Turkish greatness is all about strategic depth. It's all about carving out a unique identity. And this makes him enormously problematic because he sees uh, very clearly antagonism with Israel as a political winner, right? And he's sort of used that, he's weaponized that uh, to shore up his own support. But it's also created a lot of problems for us in the United States because Turkey is a, a core member of NATO. It's the only Middle Eastern member of NATO. And during the Cold War, it was our sort of southeastern flank, right? The sort of the early warning system for the alliance against Soviet encroachment. But we're not sure if Turkey is on board with the new agenda, the new agenda that sees NATO expanding and creating a zone of stability uh, further and further east into the, into the Balkans, further and further south into North Africa and the Middle East. And the problem that we have here is every alliance is only as strong as its most reluctant member, right? And it's mm -hmm. been very clear in recent years that Turkey is that most reluctant member. Turkey has helped Iran bust sanctions. Turkey is enormously problematic in terms of how it deals with Israel, in terms of how it uh, talks about uh, U.S. policy in the Middle East. So this is a really vexing problem. Um, and uh, it's bound up. I, I'm not sure that I have good answers for how to solve it, but it's very clear to me that the way we approach Turkey is, you know, it's sort of ebbed and flowed based upon, you know, how pragmatic Erdogan is being. What we're seeing now on the 100th anniversary of uh, Ataturk's Republic is that he's leaning into more strident, more absolutist and more anti-Western rhetoric. And that's not a good sign at all. And anti-Israel. Oh, absolutely, but, part and parcel. But sort of fascinating why he's still, I mean, he's, again, he plays both sides a little bit. Um, well, this brings me back to the big picture, which is, do you see regional war on the horizon? And what would, is are we, are we on our way to a regional war in the Middle East? Well, I'm, I'm glad you're sort of, you're asking easy questions. I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know the answer. I, I certainly hope not. And I am guardedly optimistic that we won't get there for a couple of reasons, right? And I, again, subject to revision, I could be totally wrong. But I see a couple of things um, that are beginning to take shape that give me confidence that, that we're going to stop short of that. Um, one is the growing willingness of uh, the West, in particular the United States, to hold things that Iran 
uh, values at risk, right? The deployment of carrier groups to the Eastern Mediterranean was not a signal to Hamas. It was a signal to Iran that the United States stands ready to dismantle Hezbollah if uh, Iran, through Hezbollah, opens a northern front against Israel. Uh, Iran values Hezbollah very much, right? It doesn't mean that there aren't going to be skirmishes on the northern border, but that border has been quiet, right? And, and that border is still quiet right now as we're recording this, even though there is a ground incursion underway in Gaza. And I think a lot of that has to do with deterrent potential. Um, and so, you know, uh, my counsel would always be, you know, double down on deterrence, you know, uh, let the Iranians know that they will lose, um, you know, substantially if, if they goad Hezbollah into action, right? That's one. Um, the Then there's the sort of the, the more pragmatic uh, issue of succession in Iran, right? The current supreme leader of Iran is uh, aging, he's infirm, and he is concerned about his legacy. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that in this current frame of mind, he's really somebody who's going to gamble it all on uh, a potentially apocalyptic war in the Middle East. I, you know, I, I hope that I'm correct anyway. And I the third thing. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. And one more thing, and, and which sort of uh, which relates to the wider region, which is that we have to understand that the Arab world, uh, particularly the countries of the Persian Gulf, are watching what Israel does in Gaza closely. Uh, Hamas, remember, is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, one of the things that unifies Israel with these countries is a fear of a sort of opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. The Muslim Brotherhood is opposed by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Bahrain and the Kingdom of Morocco. And so the you know what these countries, what all of these countries are doing is this interesting balancing act where the governments understand that what Israel is doing, depending on how it does it, may actually rebound in their favor politically. if The Muslim Brotherhood is weakened, um, but they understand that their streets are uh, in many cases, in most cases, very pro-Palestinian. And so they're trying to thread that needle. And so the ball very much in this context is in Israel's court, because depending on how Israel conducts its uh, invasion, its sort of cl uh, clearing out operation in Gaza is going to set the stage for whether or not the H Abraham Accords can be resumed, whether or not normalization with Saudi Arabia gets back on track. Right. It's going to determine a lot of things. So I actually had several people call me or email me. They're very concerned about a new world war. So that's not something that you see on the horizon either. I, I don't think so. Um, and I, I don't think so. Uh, but I do think that this moment politically for us is very, very clarifying. Um, clarifying both because of the reaction that we've seen to the Israel-Hamas conflict, but also clarifying in the sort of uh, the ripple effects that are visible in Western societies, uh, on university campuses, Right. Because it raises larger issues that we're going to be grappling with for the next uh, you know, number of years to come. Issues about assimilation and issues about integration and immigration. Right. These are things that I think in the fullness of time we're recognizing were not handled as well as they should have been or were not. You know, uh, we took for granted and we shouldn't have taken for granted. So there is an adjustment coming. Um, I just don't think that it's going to be in the form of a military conflict. So. Where do you see hope in the world right now? It's a good question, right? Uh, unquestionably, uh, this is a dark time, right? And and I sort of, uh, you know, I, I know you feel it, I feel it too. Um, I see hope in a the sort of the clarity that is beginning to emerge, whether it's the clarity among uh, Jews in the United States and elsewhere about the need for sort of communal investment and communal understanding, right? Um, and, or uh, it's among sort of Western governments writ large about the fact that, you know, we have values in liberal societies that are worth preserving, they're worth defending, right? Um, this is different on both fronts from the kind of drift that we've seen in recent years. So unfortunately, conflicts like this are enormously costly. But one of the silver linings, uh, if you could call it that, is it creates a clarity, a clarity of uh, sort of intellectual thinking and a clarity of uh, beliefs that, uh, you know, if we nurture it properly, I think could really strengthen us in the years to come. Which brings me back to why it's so important for us to be thinking about, and people are, I think, for the first time in a long time, thinking about the incredible 
gift we have of the liberal world order that we inherited. So thank you so much, Elon, for this conversation. I learned so much. It was so helpful. Thank you for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Elon and Nadine, for taking the time to join our Moment audience. As a reminder, you can find information about upcoming conversations and new articles on our website at momentmag.com. Again, thank you to everyone for joining us.